everybody. It's good to be with you this Lord's Day. I invite you as we continue in our worship this morning to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 6 as we will focus this morning on verse 15. John chapter 6, verse 15. John chapter 6, verse 15, follows right upon the heels of what we considered last week, Jesus' miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And this, in verse 15, is a detail that John's Gospel alone gives us, and we want to focus our attention on it this morning. John 6, verse 15, let us hear the Word of God together. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Amen. Let us hear the word of God and let's unite our hearts and let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the blessing of worship this morning being gathered as Your people, redeemed by the blood of Your Son, the eternal once-for-all sacrifice that was offered to bring Your people into a state of peace with God that has removed all of our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Father, we thank You for the life of Your Son, the Lord Jesus, lived for us. We thank You, Father, for His atoning death in which He laid down His perfect and sinless life to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank You that He has risen in power and glory and majesty and has ascended to Your right hand where He has received His kingdom, where He has received the reward for His labor and His work completed. Father, what a glorious kingdom You've given Your Son. What an unspeakable blessing that we find ourselves members of that kingdom. That we, by Your grace, have been drawn by Your Spirit to be brought from being in a state of merely flesh, dead in our sins. Your Spirit has brought us into true and eternal life in Christ. And Christ now rules and reigns in our hearts by His Spirit. You have caused the kingdom of darkness to flee from us and You have brought us to be citizens of the kingdom of Your Son. Father, as we consider this text this morning, we pray that Your Spirit would come and instruct us. That He would illumine our hearts and our minds. That we would glory in Christ's kingdom even as we see it contrasted here in the type of kingship that He refused to accept, we pray, Father, that we would give thanks that He did not accept. That He chose the path of obedience, hard obedience, even to the point of death that He might bring us into His everlasting kingdom of glory. The kingdom which will have no end and no rival. Father, draw near to us, we pray. We pray for any who are here who do not know Your Word, who do not have Your Spirit, who are not trusting in Christ. Father, we pray, be gracious to them. We pray that You would open their eyes, that they would be cut to the heart with conviction over sin, that they are yet citizens of the kingdom of darkness. And we pray, Father, that they would be drawn by Your Spirit to come to the light. We pray that Your Spirit would give them life. We know that the flesh is no help at all. And so we look to You to send Your Spirit that He would work through the proclamation of His Word. That You would be merciful to sinners and glorify Yourself, Father. Be with Your people, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I've entitled this morning's sermon, The Kingship Christ Rejected. And 
I want to spend our time a little bit slower, I know, than I usually go in John. I intended at first to preach through this entire next section, including Jesus' coming to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. But instead of doing that, that will be next week, Lord willing, I want to spend our time this morning focusing on the implications of verse 15 and various related texts. Um, while at first this text, just if you read it by itself, while it might not strike us as particularly significant, it presents for us and to us an entry point of understanding Christ's kingship and Christ's kingdom. The feeding of the 5,000, you might know, is the only miracle recorded by all four Gospel writers, excluding, of course, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And while the other three synoptic Gospels do tell us that after that miracle, Jesus retreated by Himself to the mountain to pray, it is John alone who includes for us the reason that Jesus departed from this crowd into the mountain. And as John makes very clear, it was because after seeing the miracle, this crowd sought to take Jesus by force in order to make Him king. Thus, John illustrates and Jesus illustrates for us that there is a particular kind of kingship that Jesus came into this world to exercise. There is a particular kind of kingdom that He came to rule. And all other forms of kingship He rejects. Whether those are temptations imposed upon Him by Satan like we see in Jesus' temptation, or imposed upon Him by the crowds here, or even imposed upon Him by His own disciples, Jesus refuses any kingdom that is not the one promised to Him by the Father. And so I want us to work through this text initially in our exposition, and then I'll, we'll change gears and focus on doctrine, how we're instructed, and lastly, turn to application. So let's begin our exposition together. If you have your Bibles, please have them open to John 6, particularly verse 15, but we will be going elsewhere. First of all, I want to just um, kind of handle at the front end a few three details about this verse that we might have questions about that would be helpful to address. Number one, it says that Jesus perceived that they were about to take Him by force and make Him king. Now one question that raises is how did Jesus know that? And it's possible that what we're seeing here is Jesus' office as prophet, like has been highlighted elsewhere in John's Gospel. You remember chapter 2 when He knows what's in the hearts of men? Or for instance, chapter 4 when He knew the past of the woman at the well? It is possible that Jesus, um, by way of a um, supernatural manner, knows that this is the intention of the crowd. Or this could just simply be a perception that he gained by hearing the talk and the rumbling of the crowd. Personally, I think it's probably the latter because when a crowd of 5,000 men starts to get an idea, it's not very difficult to catch wind of what exactly that idea is. But the second detail is it says they intended to take him by force. Um, if we wanted to be literal, they intended to snatch him. They intended to, to seize him. Meaning, an important detail, meaning that regardless of whether or not Jesus was agreeable to this idea, they, the crowd, had made up their idea or had made up their mind to set him up as a king as they wanted. Very important detail. In other words, they are ready, as the crowd, after they've seen his miraculous power, they are ready to force upon the Lord Jesus a reign and a rule which they saw to be expedient to their own desires and their own cause. St. Augustine said Jesus is usually sought after for something else rather than for His own sake. And that proves true here. The third detail. It says He departed from them. Now if you're thinking as you read through these narratives, Things like that make you question. I mean, a crowd of 5,000 men, and the other Gospels tell us that was not even including men and women, or, um, women and children, and somehow Jesus departs from them into the mountain alone. It does not tell us exactly how this happened. 
Lutherans and Roman Catholics, uh, Lutherans at least entertain this idea, Roman Catholics more insist on this idea, that Jesus was able to make himself his, in his humanity invisible and therefore able to retreat. And this is related to their views of the Lord's Supper, of course, of how Jesus cannot physically be there and yet the elements of his, or cannot be perceived, and yet his body can physically be in the elements of, of the bread and wine. Obviously, I don't agree with that view. Um, but again, I think there's no reason to really read into this that sort of very speculative uh, thing. There's no reason to think that Jesus didn't simply depart here by ordinary means. And again, you think about it, when a crowd this size becomes frenzied, it suddenly becomes more like a, a crazed mob, if you will, and Jesus very easily could have simply slipped away without their notice in the midst of their confusion. Okay, so those are some of the details in case we're wondering how should we make sense of some of these things. That's kind of some of the positions and you know where I land on them. But here's the main thing. And then after this, I want to open up some key questions. Here's the main thing that we're supposed to draw away from verse 15, notwithstanding some of the ambiguities of John's description. This one thing is clear. They, the crowd, sought to make Jesus a king according to their own inventions and their own desires, and Jesus refused to have it. He refused the kind of crown they wanted to give to Him. It's very important, very theologically important, very practical for our lives as Christians as we think of the kingdom of God and our citizenship in it. Now, I want to ask two questions in the remainder of our exposition. What were the motivations of the crowd to make Jesus king? And secondly, why did Jesus refuse that kind of kingship? Okay, those are the two questions. So number one, what were the crowd's motivations to make him king? And I want to give you four things, just brief. If you're taking notes, it may help to mark, at least jot down ideas in case you're not able to write down the full thought. What were the motivations of this crowd to make the Lord Jesus king in this way? I'll give you four things. Number one, it stemmed from a zeal without knowledge. Okay, remember Paul in Romans 10 talks about the Jews who have a zeal for God, but without knowledge. This motivation of this crowd is a zeal without knowledge. It's zeal in the sense that they did genuinely desire to bestow honor upon Christ. Right? And no doubt in their mind, they're thinking that certainly one such as this who is able to feed a crowd like this demands honors and titles. However, it is a knowledge that is not in accord, or excuse me, it is a zeal without knowledge because it is a zeal not in accord with what the Scriptures say about the Messianic King. The prophecies of the Old Testament do not tell us that the Messiah would be a king simply elected by people in Galilee, nor would his kingship be thrust upon him by mere men the way Saul's kingdom was thrust upon him. But rather, we read, for instance, just one example, Psalm 2, a messianic psalm, verse 6, the Lord says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's the first thing, is this stems from a zeal without knowledge of the, of the Messiah's kingship. Second thing, second reason and motivation that they wanted to make Him king. And this is an important one. Secondly, it stems from a mistake about the nature of Messiah's kingdom. It stems from a mistake about the nature of Messiah's kingdom. What they want here is a king that has a kingdom that is of this world. They wish to make him like one of the many kings that they would have been familiar with. A king like earthly kings that we're familiar with who rules over a particular people who would have all the pomp and outward show of, show of royalty and a crown and an army at his command. That's the kind of king they're thinking of making him. Um, 
Matthew Henry, a very, very, another one of his nuggets of gold, he says, them trying to make Christ a king according to the manner of earthly kings, he said, that is as great a disparagement to his glory as it would be to lacquer gold or paint a ruby. I think that's a, a brilliant illustration. Henry's saying, such is the dignity of Christ and such is the glory of his true kingdom that to try to simply make him a king of this earth is like lacquering gold and saying that's prettier than it was before or painting a ruby. Um, thirdly, this motiva a third motivation, they're trying to make him king in this manner was intended to accomplish secular and temporal designs. Okay? And I would add merely temporal and secular designs. Think about it. You, you, most of you know some of the background of the New Testament. Why does this crowd in Galilee want to make him king after they've seen what he can do? It's because they despise those who presently ruled over them, the Romans. Right? That's, that's a, just a well-known background of the New Testament. And they no doubt, after, after they saw Jesus multiply five loaves and two fish and feed this massive crowd, even with some left over, they're no doubt thinking that if Moses was a great prophet, and if he led the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land, well, if this be the greater prophet that Moses spoke about, no doubt he is also a figure like Moses who will, who will deliver us from our captive, captors and restore Israel to our freedom in the Promised Land. No doubt they saw His miraculous power to multi multiply the bread and the fish as an indication that if they could only have Him to lead them in war, they could not fail. Fourth reason, very briefly, the fourth motivation, as we will see in the remainder of the chapter, this attempt to make Him king was motivated by a love of the flesh. This will come out in the remainder of the chapter. They saw how Jesus' powers could serve to satisfy their own personal and temporal desires. And how He could feed them and care for them in abundance without the need for their sweat and in, in, uh, in toil. So that's four motivations, I think. There's probably more that we could bring out. At least those four are reasons why they attempted to make Him king. But that brings us, brings us to the second question. Why did Jesus refuse to be king this way? Why did Jesus refuse to be king this way? I'll give you several here. Number one, the glory that they offered Him, that the crowd offered Him, was nothing in comparison with the glory the Father had promised Him. Okay? The no matter how much they tried to sell it to Him, no matter how much they would talk about the earthly pomp He might have, the glory of that pales in comparison with the glory the Father promised to give the Son. You, you'll remember, we'll get there in I don't know how long, John 17, probably a long time uh, if we go at this pace. John 17, verse 5, just it, preceding His high priestly prayer, the crucifixion is about to happen. He's about to pour out His life as a sacrifice for His people. And in His final high priestly prayer, in John 17, 4 and 5, He prays to His Father, I have glorified You on the earth. I have finished the work which You have given Me to do. And He prays, so now, Father, Glorify me together with yourself with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world. In other words, what Jesus is praying to the Father there is, Father, my work has come to its end. I'm about to complete it. Father, keep your promise and give me the glory you promised me. And we'll see in other places of John, what that promise was is the Father promised the Son from eternity past as the reward for His obedience even unto death that the Father would bestow upon the Son an everlasting, never-ending kingdom. Daniel 7. If you're very quick, you can follow me with these. Um, if you're on your phone, it's probably quicker. Um, 
Daniel 7 brings us into the mystery. Okay, I've got, I see some people actually in their paper Bibles. They're taking the challenge. That's good. <laughs> Daniel 7 brings us, as Old Testament prophecy obviously, brings us into the mystery of this exchange between father and son. Uh, uh, probably a well-known passage uh, in, in Daniel's book. Daniel 7, verse 13. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like a son of man, that's referring to Christ, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, I've said this before when we were in the Olivet Discourse, I'll say it again. What Daniel is seeing here is not the Lord Jesus coming to the earth, he is seeing the Lord Jesus ascending into heaven after his victory on the earth. And he is ascending to the Father. He says he saw the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and he came to the Ancient of Days. That's the Father. And they brought him near before him. And then verse 14 of Daniel 7. Then to him, the Son, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Christian, that is an Old Testament promise of the Son receiving the reward of His labor. You can cross-reference later Isaiah 53, verse 11 and 12, where the Son receives from the Father a worldwide, never-ending kingdom. Now think about it. Jesus knows that's the kingdom His Father's promised to Him. He knows, right, for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. You think about it, these crowds are offering Him what? We'll make you a ruler of this really small piece of real estate here in Israel, and, and you'll be king against a very temporal foe. Not a very enticing alternative. You remember I mentioned the devil's temptation of Jesus. The devil knew better than these crowds. The devil knew how to offer Jesus something even more enticing. In a sense, this temptation that these crowds bring to him pale in comparison with what the devil offered him. You remember Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has three temptations that are recorded. This is the third and final temptation Satan brings to Jesus. In verse 8 of Matthew 4, it says again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And the devil said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. You think about the cunning of the devil there. right? Very similar to how he comes to Adam and Eve. He's essentially saying to Jesus, Jesus, that's what you came for anyway, isn't it? To have for your possession all the kingdoms of this world and to have a dominion that, has, that knows no bounds. And Satan says to Jesus, I will give you all of it if you will just be king my way. And verse 10 of Matthew 4, Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. You know what that meant when Jesus said that to the devil? That meant my Father, not you, my Father is the one who will give to me my kingdom, and my Father is the one who has determined how the nations will become mine. And it is not through sin and idolatry but by finishing the work which He has given me to do, which will culminate in the cross. And Jesus says to the devil, the nations will be mine, not by satanic rule, but by blood-bought redemption. Now that's the second, that brings us to the second reason that Jesus rejects this kingship. Second thing, because Jesus would forfeit His kingdom if He accepted the one they offered. He would forfeit His kingdom if He accepted the one that they offered. 
Now, I've already alluded to this. I want to make it more explicit. I've already mentioned John 17. When Jesus prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world began, on what basis did Jesus ask that of the Father? He asked that of the Father on the basis that Christ had completed the work which the Father gave Him to do. He says, My work that You gave Me is finished. And now, Father, glorify Me. Or Philippians chapter 2, the Carmen Christi, very well-known description of the Incarnation. Why does God the Father highly exalt the Son and bestow upon the Son the name that is above every name? It's because of the verse before. Because Paul, as Paul has just said, because the Son humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the point of the death of the cross, therefore, Paul says, God highly exalted Him. Christ's kingdom is one purchased through His death and through no other means. That is the way that was appointed by the Father to bring many sons to glory. His kingdom is not one of brute force, but of loving divine sacrifice. The Son of God laying down His life in the place of sinners that He might purchase for Himself a people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And without the cross, Christian, if the cross had never happened, if Jesus for one moment had said to the devil, yes, I will be king your way, or if He had for one moment acquiesced to these, these crowds and said, you know what, that sounds like a lot of a very, a very much easier, that's not the right way to say that, a way that is much easier to become king. I'll put it that way. If He had faltered for one second the kingdom that His Father promised Him would have fallen to the ground. But instead, what we see here as we saw in His temptations at the beginning of His ministry is we see the Lord Jesus' perseverance for His people. The perseverance that will build and build and require more and more strength until it culminates in the Garden of Gethsemane when He is overcome with such agony such is the weight of the wrath of the Father that He knows is going to be poured out upon Him in a few hours that we see Him sweating great drops of blood and yet what does He pray even then? Father, not My will, but Yours be done. Such is the love of Christ for His Father and the love of Christ for His people that He refused to settle for a counterfeit kingdom. And instead, He chose willingly to pour Himself out even unto death. That brings us to the third reason Jesus rejects this kind of kingship. And then we'll turn to our doctrine. Third reason. Jesus refused this kind of kingship because He refused to countenance their idea of His kingdom. He refused to countenance their idea of what His kingdom would be. Turn to John 18, verse 33. Just towards the end of the book. John 18, we'll pick up in verse 33. This is after Jesus' arrest, when He has already uh, appeared before Caiaphas, and now He appeal, uh, appears before Pilate, and He's been accused by the Jews of sedition and rebellion against the Romans. And Pilate wants to hear the charges for himself. And in verse 33, Pilate, it says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to Him, Are you the King of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning Me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to Me. What 
have you done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said to him, verse 37, Are you a king then? Or so you are a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness about the truth. Everyone who hears the truth hears my voice. What does that mean, particularly verse 36, that His kingdom is not of this world? We've already seen that that was something of the motivation of why the Jews wanted to make Him king. They wanted to make Him like a king of this world. What does Jesus mean by that? That His kingdom is not of this world. I want to give you five things, very briefly. And I mean it very briefly. A sentence or two each. There are more we could say, but five things at least it means that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Number one, it means that His kingdom does not arise from within this world. Its origin is not from or in this world. Right? The king who brings the kingdom is from heaven. And because the kingdom is not of this world, it cannot be therefore identified with any kingdom of this world. Second thing. The nature of the kingdom is it's not worldly. Its nature is not worldly. Matthew Henry says this. He says, quote, It is a kingdom within men set up in their hearts and consciences. Its riches are spiritual. Its powers are spiritual. And all of its glory is within. Secondly, or sorry, thirdly, its weapons are spiritual. The kingdom's weapons are spiritual. We'll come back to this in our our doctrine. Christ explicitly says here, one of Very important text for us, especially as Baptists. Christ explicitly says here that His kingdom is not of this world and that His kingdom is unlike the kingdoms of this world. How? Because He says it is not established by force or coercion. He says, if it were of this world, my servants would be fighting. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Rather, the kingdom of Christ is established not by the weapons of warfare, but by the Word of God and the Spirit of God persuading the hearts and consciences of men. Fourth thing it means. It means that Christ's kingdom does not do battle with the nations of this world. Okay? Christ's kingdom does not come into this world in order to overthrow human government. Christ was not a threat to Pilate and his rule. But rather, very important Christian, the kingdom of Christ does come to do battle with the kingdom of sin and darkness which dwells in the hearts of men. We'll talk about that a bit in our our doctrine. Fifthly, lastly, it means that its citizens are not of this world. The kingdom is not of this world. Its citizens are not of this world. They, we, Christian, we are in this world, but we live as citizens of the heavenly country. We'll say more about that. As we close our our exposition here, let me just say this in summary. That's the type of kingdom Jesus came to purchase with His blood. And though we see many other things, I don't want us to at least miss this. That what we are seeing in verse 15 of John 6 is that all other kinds of kingdoms this world has to offer, Jesus is not interested in. Because they will change. They will come and they will go. They will be conquered and they will be no more. But His kingdom is forever. Okay. Now, let's change our direction here. Let's turn to our doctrine. How, having considered something of the meaning of the text, the background of the text, 
doctrinally, how are we instructed by this text? And I, I have two things that I want to open up in some, somewhat deta- a bit of detail. The first thing that I want to open up under our doctrinal heading is this. It's answering the question, what is the kingdom of God? Okay? What is the kingdom of God? That's the first thing I want to open up for us. And I know I've already said something somewhat negatively from Jesus' words about what the kingdom of God is not. Jesus says it's not of this world. But positively, how are we to understand and think about and articulate what the kingdom of God is? That's what I want to open up with us. And the reason I want to open that up for us is because this is a very vital thing for us to understand in our day. There are misunderstandings in our day, just as there have been throughout the history of the church. Don't get me wrong. It's not like we're the first generation to come to some wrong conclusions on this. But there are misunderstandings in our day which conflate the kingdom of Christ with things that it ought not to be conflated with or confused with. Okay? I'll, I'll give you an example question just to kind of give you an idea of what, what I'm getting at here. You'll see, and you don't have to answer this, but answer in your head. Um, is America in any sense the kingdom of God? Can any earthly nation ever be said to be coextensive with the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ? Now, don't misunderstand the question I'm asking. I'm not asking, can Christians and the church have significant influence on nations and have significant influence on societies and institutions? Of course they can. And in fact, I pray to that end that Christians would have more influence on those things. But does that make those nations or institutions the kingdom of Christ? The answer, biblically speaking, is a resounding no. When God destroyed the Jewish temple in A.D. 70, that was the judgment of God upon the things of old, right? The old covenant. When He destroyed the temple in 70 A.D., That was God's final word that no longer will His kingdom be identified by physical, earthly things. You remember, we already saw this, John chapter 4. Jesus says to the woman at the well, the hour is coming and now is. When what? Neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will worshipers worship the Father, but rather true worshipers will worship how? In spirit, the Holy Spirit, and in truth. Israel's earthly kingdom, the physical kingdom of Israel, Old Covenant Israel, was a dress rehearsal for the real thing that has now been inaugurated in the person and work of Christ and is now being applied by His Holy Spirit in the world. In fact, it's amazing. Sometimes this... um, I guess flabbergast might be the right word. Sometimes it flabbergasts interpreters the way that the New Testament sometimes interprets Old Testament prophecies as being fulfilled. Um, For instance, the way the New Testament tells us the Old Testament promises to rebuild the Davidic kingdom. The way the New Testament tells us that's fulfilled is not what you would expect. For instance, Acts 15. You can... um, You can look at it later. Unless you're fast, you can go there. In the New Testament, Jesus is described as the greater David, right? David's greater son. He is the heir of David's throne. But in Him, the person of Christ, the types and shadows of the Davidic kingdom are transformed to a greater glory. For instance, the example... I I got ahead of myself. The example here in Acts 15... God promised in Amos, for instance, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, that the Davidic kingdom would be rebuilt. And Amos said this. He said, after this, this is the Lord speaking, after this I will return 
and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Now here's what's amazing. Is that the Apostle James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Acts 15, which is the Jerusalem Council, guess how James says that prophecy was fulfilled? He says that prophecy Amos made was fulfilled when Gentiles experienced the salvation of Christ and received the Holy Spirit. That was the fulfillment of the rebuilding of David's kingdom. As the salvation of Christ goes to the Gentiles and the ministry of the Spirit causes sinners to be born again and brought into not the Davidic kingdom, but the greater kingdom, the kingdom of God. If you don't believe me, read Acts 15 later, okay? I'll just leave that there. But the point I'm making here, and then I want to turn to something very important, is that the kingdom of Christ is no longer a physical kingdom like the Jews had. Those were the types and shadows and an Old Testament theocracy, but the kingdom of Christ is now a spiritual kingdom marked by knowing Christ savingly and possessing His Spirit whether Jew or Gentile. And that's what I want to turn to for the next few moments here. Still on the same, the same doctrinal instruction. That emphasis on possessing the Holy Spirit in order to be in the kingdom is something especially important and noteworthy. And I say that because it is something that is seemingly often overlooked in these discussions. Okay, so turn with me to Matthew 12. This one I'll actually give you time to get there. Matthew chapter 12. And I want you to see here how Jesus describes and defines the kingdom of God. Okay? Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. We'll pick up there. The context here is the Pharisees have accused Christ. He's just cast out demons and the Pharisees accuse Him well, you're just casting out demons by the power of demons, right? Or by the power of Satan. And so pick up in verse 25 of Matthew 12. It says, But Jesus knew their thoughts, and He said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, right? That's what they're accusing Him of doing. He is divided against Himself. How then will His kingdom stand? Verse 27, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But notice verse 28. This is what I want to highlight. Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom has come upon you. And then he says in verse 29, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. So just step back from that passage for a second. Still look at it. Big picture. If we had more time, we could go more detail. I'm just going to give you big picture. Jesus describes his kingdom here as the conquering and plundering of Satan's kingdom. Right? Satan is the strong man of verse 29, by the way. And Jesus has just cast out the powers of Satan. He's just cast out demons in their midst by the power of the Spirit of God. And Jesus says to them, that is how you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. He doesn't say, going back to my original question, is America the kingdom of God? He doesn't say, for instance, you know, when a nation nominally declares itself to be Christian, the kingdom of God has come upon, upon you. He doesn't say when laws are brought more into conformity with the Ten Commandments, which believe me, you know, I pray for that. But he doesn't say when that happens, the kingdom of God is upon you. Christian, the kingdom of God is where Christ, by the power of His Spirit, is conquering Satan's kingdom and is ruling and reigning in the hearts of men by that Spirit. John Calvin. Okay, if you don't believe me, you'll hopefully give more credit to these guys. 
John Calvin says Christ's kingdom lies in the Spirit, not in earthly pomp or pleasures. John Owen says the kingdom of Christ is spiritual. It is not an outward visible ordination by men, but it is, listen, Christ's communicating of that Spirit, capital S, that Spirit that gives life, being, usefulness, and success to ministry. That's how Calvin and Owen are defining the kingdom. It is the presence of the Spirit of Christ. And, and you think about it, that shouldn't be a surprise to us. Right? We, um, chapter 3, Nicodemus. What does Jesus say has to happen for someone to enter or even see the kingdom of God? You have to be born again by who? The Spirit. Right? Usually we, we usually think of that as um, a text that focuses on what the individual sinner needs to experience to enter the kingdom, and that's true. But it's also, Jesus is giving there a description of the nature of the kingdom, isn't he? That you are only in the kingdom, and that's made plain by his words, you can't even see it unless you have been made alive by the Spirit because the kingdom is the realm of the Spirit. If you're not in the Spirit, according to Jesus, you're not in the kingdom. The Apostle Paul says the exact same thing. Romans 8, verse 9. He says, Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Okay. Now think about that. If you don't even belong to Christ because you don't have the Spirit, how can you be in the kingdom without having the Spirit? Are we really wanting to say that you can be in Christ's kingdom without belonging to Christ? Romans 14, 17, just six chapters later, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in what? The Holy Spirit. Again, the kingdom of God linked to the possession of the Spirit. Christian, listen to me. The kingdom of God, we could say, is in two places right now in, on earth. It's number one in the heart of the Christian, and it's number two in the church. Because those two things are the only two things which are called the temple of God, where God's Spirit dwells. Outside of that, I'm not denying the common grace God shows to sinners. I'm not denying the common operations of the Spirit in common grace. But outside of that, the genuine Christian and the church, it's not the kingdom. That's one reason I think Paul refers to excommunication and church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5 as handing someone over to who? Satan. Because in Paul's mind, anywhere outside the church is not the kingdom of God anymore, but it is the realm of darkness. Now, you're all waiting for me. Why go through the pains of harping on that? And I did harp on it for a little bit. Thank you for bearing with me. I think this is very important, Christian. And what I'm about to say, some of you in this room will have sympathies of, for the very things that I'm going to speak very strongly against. Others of you already have an allergy to the things that I'm about to speak against. And so some of you will love me and some of you will definitely have questions for me, okay? Such is the nature of preaching. This is important because there is a lot of confusion today about what Christ's kingdom is and how we ought to define it. And here's why that matters, Christian. Listen. It matters because how we think about the kingdom and define the kingdom is inseparably connected to how we will go about seeking to progress the kingdom. Okay? If you believe the kingdom's one thing, you're going to go about bringing that about one way. If you believe it's another thing, you're going to use different methods and different means. So I'll tell you one example that I'm thinking of this week and this morning. Christian Reconstruction, which is closely associated with theonomy. 
Some of you don't know what that is. You've now been given two terms that you can Google later on. <laughs> Christian reconstruction and theonomy. Where in my opinion, there is a blurring of categories and a confusing of the common kingdom of this world with the kingdom of God. I'll give you examples. There is a battle cry among these circles, among many in these circles. I want to be careful that I don't paint with too broad a brush. There is a battle cry amongst many in these circles to create what they call so-called Christian businesses Christian societies and the call for Christians to redeem the culture for the kingdom of God. Now, don't misunderstand me, okay? Here, here's what I'm, I'm not saying. You, another, another, I'll, I'll give another example and then I'll explain what I'm not saying. Sometimes you will hear people in these circles, even thinking of what just recently happened with Roe v. Wade and it being overturned, they will speak of that as a victory for the kingdom of God. Here's what I'm not saying. You know that I and we together as a church pray for the abolishment, the abolition of abortion. And we're even involved in trying to be a part of making that happen. You know that we pray for businesses to operate in a way that is in line with God's commands. You know that we want Christians to be influential in society. We would rather see a society following God's commands in an external way than outright rebellion against those commands, right? Okay, that's, that's important that we understand that. But that, even if you get that society to happen, that is not the same Christian as Christ ruling in the hearts of men by His Spirit plundering the kingdom of darkness and bringing sinners into the kingdom of the sun. Okay, hear me. It does not matter how externally a person or a group might be influenced by Christian ethics and Christian morality and Christian whatever it may be. Where the gospel is not cherished in the heart, and where the Spirit of God is not reigning in the heart, and where men and women are not submitting to the rule of Christ in all sincerity, the kingdom of Christ is not there yet. And it needs to be brought there. Second thing, second doctrine. So everyone, write down your questions now. We can fight about it afterwards. Second thing in terms of being instructed doctrinally. How is the kingdom progressed? How is the kingdom progressed? That's the second question I want us to answer. What are the methods or the means by which Christ from heaven builds His church and spreads the kingdom? And the simple answer to that is His Gospel and His Spirit. Just as Jesus here in John 6 refused to be taken by force to be made king, so also His kingdom is not forced upon the world by coercion or force. Right? We, we saw that in John 18, 36. If my kingdom were of this world, my disciples would be fighting so that I should not be delivered. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus instructed His disciples on earth not to use the tools of warfare and force to prevent Him even from being crucified. And so also, His church is not to seek to spread the kingdom by force or threat. So for example, the civil magistrate ought not to be given the authority to enforce true religion. It shouldn't be given the authority to show particular favor to one set of theological beliefs versus another. That's not how Jesus describes the spread of His kingdom. While it's true He did speak, for instance in Matthew 12, of sinners who are taking the kingdom by violence, His kingdom does not take sinners by violence. But rather, He grows His kingdom by the persuasion of the Gospel and the inward persuasion of the Spirit, changing the hearts of men. 
I want to start with the first part of that. And I've just realized that I'm already behind time. This is two weeks in a row. I must be really slowing down in my preaching pace or adding way too much that's not in my notes. Um, He spreads his kingdom, first of all, by the persuasion of the gospel. Notice that smooth transition. It doesn't mean I'm going to change anything for you. It just means I acknowledge I'm going late. (laughs) I'll try. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, says this. He says, by the manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Or 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. He says, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He says, Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We could look at many others. Christ's army is not a violent army of force and threat, but rather it is an army that persuades and woos and pleads with men's consciences to be reconciled to God through Christ. Right? You think of Matthew 13. That's, that's the, chap, the big chapter in Matthew of the parables of the kingdom. And you think of how Jesus describes the growth of the kingdom. No less than four times, Jesus compares the spread of the kingdom to the sower who what? Sows the seed on all sorts of different types of soils. It's the picture of just as a farmer sows the seed indiscriminately, seeing which ground will take, that's what the church does. That's how the kingdom grows. We persuade in that sowing. We debate even. We... Um, we give defense of our faith, but we do not threaten. We do not destroy a man's liberty of conscience by enforcing upon him temporal punishments if he doesn't believe. There will be punishment for those who reject the gospel. Christ makes that very clear that he will judge all men for their unbelief and call them to give an account And he will separate the wheat from the chaff. But that is Christ's prerogative, not the prerogative of his church. And it's interesting, in that same Matthew 13, he goes on to describe how the church will grow. He compares it to the mustard seed. Right? That starts small. The mustard seed is the smallest of all garden seeds. And before you know it, it's the biggest tree in the whole garden. And it gives shade to the whole thing. He also describes it as a woman who takes three parts flour and puts leaven into it until the whole thing is leavened. Right? What does leaven do? It doesn't destroy the flour. It works its way through the flour. It influences the flour. That's how the kingdom spreads. And by the way, I'll say this just so I can make friends with someone I've already probably made angry at me. That's what the optimistic eschatology of many of the Puritans was centered upon, okay? Um, I've said before, I'm not currently post-millennial. I'm open to talk about it. But many of my heroes, the Puritans, many of them were post-millennial, okay? And they believed that before Christ's return, there will be a great triumph of the kingdom all across this world. But here's the thing. The post-millennialism of the Puritans was a gospel-centered post-millennialism. They were not just looking for an institutionalized Christianity where everyone's just nominally Christian and we all kind of somewhat to an external sense follow the Ten Commandments and we don't break the Sabbath. That's what Old Testament Israel was, right? And that didn't turn out very well. Jesus wasn't very happy with that kind of religious insincerity, was he? That's not what the Puritans hoped for in their post-millennial hope. They hoped for a world in which men and women and children were from the heart persuaded by the gospel. They knew the Lord Jesus Christ savingly and they walked in his spirit in sincerity. And by the way, if that's you and you're that kind of post-millennialist, I want to be friends with you, okay? And I'm even happy to talk, and I might even be able to be persuaded to a degree. Because what those two, whether you're me or whether you're that person, what they have in common is the spread of the kingdom is intimately tied to the persuasion of the gospel. 
and the Spirit using the Gospel not just for external conformity, but rather the real heart business of I'm going to give them a heart of flesh and give them My Spirit and cause them to walk in My statutes. Now, secondly, that's the first thing. The Kingdom spreads by the outward persuasion of the Gospel. Secondly, it spreads not only by the outward persuasion of the Gospel, but by the inward persuasion of the Spirit of God in men's hearts. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, for this reason we thank God without ceasing. Because when you, Thessalonians, received the Word of truth, or the Word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God which effectively works in you who believe. A couple of questions. Why did they receive it that way? And why does Paul thank God that they received it that way? The answer is to get ahead of myself. We'll get there in a matter of weeks. The answer lies in Jesus' words in John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The kingdom grows when the Lord Jesus sends not only His Word to people through the mouth of His servants, but also when He sends His Holy Spirit to reveal to sinners the things of God. Like He did with Lydia in the book of Acts. You remember where it gives us that detail that the Lord opened the heart of Lydia to receive and believe the things which were spoken by Paul. Brothers and sisters, that is a, a, comf- a comfort to us in our evangelism. The Christian, you and me, limited, finite, fallible men, what's our job? We persuade. We use human intellect. We use everything the Lord has gifted us with and equipped us with. We use human words. We are armed, hopefully, by the word of truth in our hearts. But that is entirely on an, that's on an entirely different playing field than what the Holy Spirit comes and does. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't just come with human persuasion, but He comes by effectual divine power and an irresistible sway by which the sinner is made to be alive and made to believe the Word of the Gospel. Christian, that's where the kingdom expands its borders. When, to quote the title of that old famous book, the kingdom expands its borders when the life of God enters into the soul of man and brings him from death to life, from idolatry to worship, and the Spirit of Christ indwells the sinner. That brings us to our application. And it is brief, okay? So we'll be done in five minutes here. I'm going to hope that Brandon accidentally went long today or we started really late, one or the other. Um, Application as we close. Here's my burden. If we misunderstand the kingdom Jesus came to purchase, we are liable to promote it with wrong and ignorant means. And we need to take the warning from this text. We don't want to imitate these crowds in being those who have a zeal without knowledge and seek to honor Christ as king in a way he never intended to be king. Okay, So I have three things for us. They're all brief. Three applications for us. Number one, Christian, let us fix our minds on the kind of kingdom Jesus came to establish. It's the first thing. We can't do the the second or the third until we get that in our mind. Let us set our minds on the kind of kingdom Jesus came to establish. It is not a kingdom that is from this world or that is of this world. It is the kingdom of heaven which has broken into this world to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, our King, has come from heaven so that through His life and His death and His resurrection, He might bind the devil so that the devil might no longer deceive the nations and Christ is now plundering Satan's kingdom. 
He's bound the strong man. He's tied him, chained him, and Christ is plundering from the kingdom of darkness His people. Christian, we are people who belong to a kingdom that is heavenly. Now, it will one day come in the fullness of its manifestation when Christ returns on earth to reign with us forever and ever. But now, we live as citizens of a heavenly country yet to come. We wage war against the kingdom of darkness with spiritual weaponry, armed with the sword of truth, which is the word of God, and assisted in that work by the Spirit of God. Secondly, therefore, Christian, let us wield the sword of truth. Let us wield the sword of truth. Where has God invested His power against principalities and powers? Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God, Paul exhorts us to put it on. Paul describes the only, the only offensive weapon Paul describes the Christian as having is what? The sword of the Spirit, which he tells us, which is the Word of God. The Spirit uses the Word of God in the mouth of Christians to disarm unbelief, to convict of righteousness and judgment to come, and to tear down the strongholds of idolatry and the strongholds of falsehood. And so, Christian, let us be eager to take it up. What that means, Christian, is know the Word of God. Be skilled in the body of its doctrine. Seek to be and long to be like a skilled physician who just knows the ins and outs of the human body and they can see this this kind of wound needs this and they just know how to minister to different needs. Seek to be like that with your Bible. Knowing the different kinds of sinners that we interact uh, interact with in the world and how God has given us His Word to know and to bring to bear on each individual person in each individual circumstance. It's the Word of God that searches the hearts of men and lays us bare, as Hebrews says. Know the Word of God and wield the sword of truth. Thirdly, finally, Christian, pray for the Spirit. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come in power. We sing that hymn. It's a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Let Thy bright beams arise. Dispel the darkness from our eyes and open all our eyes. That's a good prayer and we should pray it with sincerity. Paul, in calling the Christian to take up the the sword of the Spirit and the armor of God, he tells us this. He says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, and pray for me that utterance may be given me that I may open my mouth boldly and I may speak as I ought to speak. Christian, pray for the ministry of the Spirit. Don't go about seeking to learn the Word of God and seeking to speak the Word of God without dependence upon the Spirit who gives it power, saving power. But rather, pray for the Spirit. Pray for revival. Whose hand does revival rest in? It's not ours. There is no mechanical power Uh, what do you call it, ABC thing that you can just do this and do this and do this and bingo, God will pour out revival. The Spirit is sovereign. He's like the wind. He blows where He wills and therefore what ought we to do? We should beseech the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and take us up as weak men and women and instruments in Your hand and breathe life and power and convert the lost and glorify Christ to the glory of God the Father.
Christian, let us today go forth as the Lord's army, armed with the Gospel, and by the powerful enabling of His Spirit who assists us to fight the good fight. Christ will have the prize for which He died, an inheritance of nations. He shall, Isaiah 53, verse 11, see the labor of His soul and be satisfied. Christian, let us take heart and follow the Lord, praying Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Let's pray. Father, we pray that You would instruct us in these things. Father, renew and revive in us a zeal for Your kingdom. How glorious and magnificent the kingdom of Christ is. We love Your church, O God, as we sing the bride of Christ bought with His precious blood. We pray, Father, that we would be thankful to be a part of it and that we would be willing and glad soldiers in the army of Christ to see others brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the safety of the kingdom of light. Father, help us to understand Your Word rightly and to divide it rightly. We pray that we would live as citizens of the kingdom that is to come, even as we are pilgrims here on this earth. We pray that our hearts would long to see Your churches full that our hearts would long to see You pour out Your pity upon, upon the nations. Father, do it for Your name's sake, we pray. Send Your Spirit amongst us in greater measures. Lord, warm our hearts to the things of Christ, the things that He has commanded us to be busy about until He returns. Draw near to us and bless us, we pray. Bless our meal together, our time of fellowship, strengthen our bonds in Christ, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.